going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. I think this could be a, a, a new page for our community. That's, that's what we're hoping it is. It's not an indication that we've arrived, but it's an indication that we're turning the page. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. The opening of the 99th annual NAACP convention brings energy and hope to both the nation's oldest civil rights organization and to Greater Cincinnati. To discuss where the NAACP stands after 99 years of work, I am joined by Rosalind McAllister Brock, the National Vice Chairman of the NAACP. Beyond her work with the NAACP, she is the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for Bon Secours Health uh, System in Marriottville, Maryland. Welcome to Cincinnati. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. And we're taping on a Friday morning, but this airs on Sunday. By the time people see it, the convention will have opened, okay. and you will be running around trying to keep everything going. Okay. So good luck with the convention. This Thank is you. very big. In 2008, um, after a, almost a century of, of work, what would you, how would you describe the mission and the top agenda items of the NAACP at this point in time? The mission of the NAACP remains the same. It is to eliminate and eradicate any vestige of racial discrimination in our society. And so after almost 100 years, we're still standing firm to try to ensure equity and equality for all Americans. And, and has the focus I mean, over a hundred years, the yes. focus has to change. How would you describe the shifting focus in the last, say, 10, 15 years? Well, as the nation has changed, so has the NAACP. We've had to change to respond to the changing challenges of our, of our society and also the needs of minorities and people of color across our, our nation. And so in the forefront now on our agenda, particularly what's happening in the area of home foreclosures, uh, access to quality health care, and uh, stimulating an economic economy in our, in our nation are some of the things that we are working on right now. Yes, and if, if people go to the website, and, which I encourage people to do because there's a lot of information on the website, uh, on this area of foreclosures, uh, you, the, the organization, as I understand it, if I can see it right, read it right, is actually filed suit yes. about the way certain lending, lenders have manipulated the markets and manipulated the sorts of instruments that they've offered on the basis of race is your argument, right? That, that Absolutely. African Americans have been treated differently. Particularly African Americans. On July the 2nd, uh, all across the countries in large cities and small cities, we had an, a national day of action uh, to bring to light some of the issues. We've uh, brought a lawsuit against 17 of the major lenders in our nation because they have systematically uh, uh, brought about or entered into loan agreements with African Americans that they would not have for majority communities. Now, foreclosure mm -hmm. crisis <clears throat> is something that we all see every night on the news, every day we open the newspapers, uh, and all sorts of people are caught up in this. Absolutely. Not just African Americans, not just minorities, but all sorts of people. Why, what's your argument that the, the lending institutions have treated minorities, and particularly African Americans, differently when so many people are being affected. Well, I'm <clears throat> excuse me, I'm glad you brought that point up. But well, what we found is that disproportionately in some of our, our larger urban communities, African Americans were granted loans or entered into loans that high, had higher interest rates than some others that were disproportionate. So that's why we're saying that disproportionately there appears to be a systematic uh, entering into loans by people of color. Now, one of the things about that particular initiative, since it is a lawsuit, mm -hmm. there is a tradition of uh, the NAACP of working through the courts. Right. I mean, different organizations have tried to move the issues around race and discrimination in our society. They've tried to confront them in different ways. But this has always been a hallmark of your organization, that it's using the courts to try to address these problems. Is that still sort of a major focus of what you do? Absolutely. Uh, we believe in legislative, legis legislation, mobilization, and activism in order to bring about public policy change in our nation. That has been the hallmark of the NAACP's uh, legislative work and will continue to be so. Okay. 
So uh, let's just t take a look at a couple of other things. One of the other issue types of things, the, the effort that the organization made over the years to desegregate schools. Now in 2008, <coughs> you know, we all know that particularly urban schools where a lot of African Americans, particularly lower income African Americans, working class African Americans, are in those center city school systems. Um, you know, desegregation didn't necessarily maybe bring about the type of better services that had been hoped. What's, what's the role of uh, the NAACP at this point in terms of trying to move forward education questions? Well, we're particularly concerned about what's happening in terms of teacher salaries, uh, the whole phenomenon of resegregation of our urban centers mm -hmm. where uh, African Americans and Hispanics are generally in a school or being resegregated and then that the public school systems are not uh, very diverse. And so we are working uh, with uh, the school boards across the country to try to do something about that problem. You know, you just mentioned, uh, particularly with Hispanics, but there's a lot of immigrants who have come yes. to uh, the United States in the last 20, 25 years. The NAACP has never been, the membership has never just been African Americans. There's always been a variety of people who have been members and active in the organization, both on the local level and the national level. Is there an outreach to these new minorities, these new immigrants from the organization itself and trying to say become part of our organization or is it a matter that the NAACP says we'll work with organizations that um, uh, are representing those groups? What, what's sort of the approach? Well since the very beginning the NAACP has been a multicultural, multi-ethnic organization and we really believe that colored people come in all colors and so even today uh, a large majority of our, our membership uh, base are people who are Caucasians, who are Hispanic, who are Asians, and who are in the leadership of the organization. And so we welcome everyone who are interested in equal rights and equal opportunity and human rights for our nation to come and be a part of our organization. I think that would probably be surprising to a lot of people, well, though. You know, it's, it, it, if you're close to the organization, you know that that's true, but that's not necessarily what gets projected. Well, we have a, a young lady who's on the campus, I believe, of Georgetown University, who is a Caucasian uh, young woman who was elected by her peers, African Americans, to be the president of that local college chapter. Caused a lot oh. of stir across the country, but we've had a Caucasian uh, president of our Miami-Dade County NAACP and other places across our country. So what uh, people fail to realize is that the NAACP was started established in 1909 by majority white individuals uh, in New York. And so we have always been and always open to everyone and embracing all um, spectrums of our society. You know, the, uh, the, the lot of this convention is going to deal with all the issues inside the organization, but probably the thing that will get the most headlines <laughs> is going to be the fact that both presidential candidates, presumptive presidential candidates, are going to speak to the convention later this week, both Senators McCain and Barack Obama. What is the role of the organization in politics, in electoral politics, in partisan politics? We are the NAACP. We are a nonpartisan organization, and so we will not take a formal position, Republican, Democrat, Independent, on any issue. Our goal is simply to mobilize and to register individuals to vote and to make them aware of the issues that are of import to them in our community today. And so over the ensuing months until November, we will be conducting massive voter registration, voter mobilization activities in communities across this country. Uh, particularly here in Cincinnati, our Youth and College Division will be going out into the community and registering voters. Now, it's not just registering voters, again, as I read the website, mm -hmm. you're particularly concerned about the conduct of elections. Absolutely. And, and given the last two presidential <laughs> elections, 2000 and 2004, there have been a series of issues that have come up. What's the organization doing to try to make sure that those kinds of issues are addressed, particularly as they relate 
to minority uh, voters because that was the question in a lot of cases. Well, we're concerned about vote, uh, election fraud and uh, um, having unfettered access uh, to the voting box. And so we will have election monitors uh, at polling booths uh, across the nation. We'll be watching from our mobilization center in Baltimore, our, the hub, uh, watching all across the country's calls that come in about election fraud. Uh, we're here in Cincinnati because of some of the things that happened in the 2004 presidential election. Uh, as you know, uh, Cincinnati is part of Hamilton County and is the, so the second largest voting district uh, in Ohio. And so we have returned to Ohio, which is a very pivotal state right. uh, for the presidential election, uh, to bring to bear t uh, to light some of the issues that happened in 2004 to ensure that this time every voter gets to the poll, but not only do they get there, but that their votes are counted. Obviously, Ohio is critical, Cincinnati is critical, Cleveland is critical, Columbus, the, the big cities are all critical. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you perceive, what are some of the practices that you're particularly concerned about to make sure that people do have access this time? Or are there concrete things that you want to make sure either happen or don't happen this time? Well, in the last presidential election, we heard allegations that individuals came, uh, arrived at polling places and were told that they should come the, the next day or that they should go across town or that their name was not on the voting rolls or that they did not have proper identification. We want to make sure to ensure that those types of things do not happen this year. And so we're trying to ensure that the proper documentation is in place in terms of uh, residences and uh, tracking information so that when individuals come to the polls, they feel good about that experience, that when they vote and they cast their vote, that their vote will be counted. You know, you were saying before that the organization as an organization is nonpartisan. Absolutely. And you will take no position. It can't be irrelevant to the members of the organization, though, that for the first time there is an African American who is the presumptive nominee of one of the major parties. What do you think? What's the buzz? What's, what's going on inside the organization? Or let me put it this way in with the members of the organization because Barack Obama is going to be the, the Democratic nominee? I think the buzz is as it is all across the country. There is a sense of pride uh, that a, an African American male or a person of African descent has, is almost, or has the ability to hold the highest office uh, in the free world. Um, that buzz and that, that whole climate of change is buzzing across our organization. However, I just want, just as the organization is a multicultural, multi-ethnic organization, we also represent all the spectrums in the political parties. So we have Republicans who are in the leadership of our organization who are very excited about a, the prospect of a McCain presidency as well. And so we have to balance those two within our organization. So you can honestly say that there are people of a Republican persuasion, Democratic uh, yes. persuasion in the leadership of the organization. Yes, they are. Okay. And and um, those uh, those policies and uh, the enthusiasm when a Republican candidate comes to the floor of the convention to uh, make a uh, speech um, is welcome as would a Democratic uh, person. Does the, the the big speeches will be the public events? Right. Does the leadership have a chance to talk to these two candidates off to the side more? during the convention, when they come here this week, will you have a chance with the board, for example, to sit down with each candidate? We will. Actually, we've allowed our delegates to have an opportunity also to engage the candidates. We had a presidential candidates uh, forum where on our website, uh, all citizens from across the country could register questions that uh, mm -hmm. we sent to the uh, presumptive candidates for them to respond to uh, when they come to give their speech. Because we want to make sure that the delegates who are at our convention hear something from the presumptive nominees that they want to hear. It's not a canned speech and that they're not talking to them, but they're responding to issues that are of importance to them. Just about out of time, but just one final area, and it started with Christopher Smitherman at the beginning yeah. saying it was very important to us that uh, your organization chose Cincinnati this year. We talked a little bit about one of the dynamics there being the importance of the presidential election and Ohio's role, Hamilton County's role in that. Was it also, to what extent was it an issue, an important question 
a symbolic decision because Cincinnati in recent time with the 2001 riots had some really difficult times around issues of race and minority status and how important from the national organization was it to decide to come here this year? Uh, we needed to come to Cincinnati uh, because of the things that I shared earlier about the 2004, the race riots and also the 2000, 2001 race riots, right. but also the 2001 voter irregularities. We've returned to the state of Ohio, city of Cincinnati, to deal with those issues of voter voting and the presidential elections. But it's important to note that Cincinnati earned the right to host the NAACP National Convention. It's come a long way since 2001. Everything is not as it should be, but we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to come and to partner with the Queen City and all of its leadership and its citizens to showcase to the nation what can happen when citizens really get together, deal with the issue of race, but then talk about how working together they can bring about prosperity and economic opportunity for all. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Cincinnati. Have a really good meeting here this, this week, and I hope you have a little bit of time <laughs> to enjoy our city. And if you don't this week because you're so busy in meetings, come back. We're looking forward to it, and thanks so much. Okay. Stay tuned. After the break, a discussion about the origins of the NAACP in Cincinnati. My name is W.P. Dabney, and I'm the first president of the chapter of Cincinnati NAACP. My name is W. P. Dabney, and I'm the president of the first chapter, first Cincinnati chapter of the NAACP. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm also uh, the author, the editor, publisher of the Union newspaper, which is a weekly newspaper. Just six years after the NAACP was organized nationally the multi-talented Wendell Phillips Dabney led the organization of a chapter here in Cincinnati. Today, Benny Butler helps bring Dabney back to life on a streetcar at the Cincinnati Museum Center. Welcome back. Founded in 1915, the Cincinnati chapter of the NAACP is one of the oldest in the nation. I am joined now by Jim Jones, the historian of the Cincinnati branch, to talk about the origins of the association here in Cincinnati. Jim, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. And it's a pleasure uh, being here. This is a this is a chapter of the organization that has over the years an amazing number of very interesting people connected to it. Yes. And let's start with Wendell Phillips Dabney, the founder. Um, how did this organization come about in Cincinnati? Who really came together to, to create this? Well, I think there were about 14 people that came together from what I've read. And he wrote a letter to New York wanting to have this chapter, and he was granted permission to have the chapter. And the uh, charter was sent, I think, in February. Uh, Go ahead, keep up. In February of uh, 1915. It's when, the, and we have the original cha uh, charter, and we're very fortunate to have the charter. And we're seeing images of Dabney. Dabney was this incredibly multi-talented person. He, as, as was just said, he was a newspaper publisher. Yes, yes. He was also a musician and a music yes, teacher. Yes. And he was a uh, city paymaster for yes, a while. Yes, And, and he, he just had, here we got, you can see the charter, which we yes. you brought with us this morning. So. This is the origins, and you know, what was Cincinnati like when the, the NAACP chapter was was formed here? Or, around the questions. Of well, race. of course, you know, I was not around back in nineteen fifteen. No, no, I know that. 
<laughs> well, it was interesting. Uh, Daphne felt that there was a need for the Cincinnati, for, to have a branch in Cincinnati. Uh, there were some racial problems, and Daphne felt that it was important to have this chapter. And, uh, you know, there was uh, some uh, rumors that I've read that there was also uh, someone else trying to start a chapter in Cincinnati, too, oh, really? from Allen Temple. But, of course, National said that the city could only have one uh, chapter, and, of course, Dabney was awarded that uh, charter to have that chapter here in Cincinnati. And, of course, Allen Temple was one of the major yes, uh, yes. black congregations yes, in downtown yes, Cincinnati, yes, uh, yes. basically where Procter & Gamble is today. Yes, People know, yes, know where yes, that is. Yes, they don't yes. remember the, the church itself. Yes. Um, Dabney was sort of a... A renaissance, tenacious. yes, yes. Yeah, it was renaissance yeah, guy. Right. He was also pretty tenacious. <laughs> oh, yes, he was. Oh, sure. Sort of the other big figure at the time in Cincinnati's black life was Jenny Porter. Yes. And the two of them oh, did no, not get along. No, no, she would not allow her teachers to become members of the NAACP for many, many years. And until Ted Berry got involved and was able, because he was a protege of, of uh, Jenny Porter, and he was able to talk with her and get her to consider having the teachers come over and be members. And it, it's probably hard for people in 2008 to realize that back there, almost a century ago, there were these different approaches. Mm -hmm. And Jenny Porter, as the head of the segregated section of the Cincinnati Public Schools was a believer and a follower of Booker T. Washington, yes, yes. who was an assimilationist, yes. rather than the NAACP, yes. and in, which was an integrationist, a desegregation yes. integrationist yes. approach. Yes, she, yes, that's true. She felt that there should be separate schools, schools for African Americans, and then, but he did not feel that way. He felt that people should integrate and go to schools together and have better education and books and, and, and buildings. And I agree with them too. <laughs> you know, one of the, you just mentioned a key sort of linchpin in the early part of the organization's history, and that was Theodore Berry, Mr. Yes, Berry. Yes, yes. Let's look, back in 1981, I did an interview with Mr. Berry, mm -hmm. and he talked about a lot of things, but he talked about his observations of what life was like in those years for him. Let's take a listen okay. to this. But I became aware of, of the restraints, the strictures imposed, the hostility that prevailed toward uh, Negroes in this community. Uh, I remember as a, a young man going to the Sinton Hotel for some purpose and was told that I could not ride the elevator. I'd have to take the freight elevator to get to the place where I was going. I was then a young lawyer. Uh, so the patterns of segregation were very deep rooted in this community. I think it's hard for us today to realize, you know, and I think you can hear it in Mr. Barry's voice that even, that was 1981, but he was referring back to the late 20s, early yes. 30s when he was a young lawyer you know, it still was there for him mm -hmm. and how different the conditions were at that yes. time. You know, it was interesting. Mr. Berry was only 26 years old when he became president of the NAACP, and he had also been vice president before president of the NAACP. Yeah. And I think he's probably the youngest president that we've had. I'm going to check and do some research on that. And, and throughout his life, uh, through his work as a lawyer in the courts, we, we were talking in the first part of the show about the NAACP's commitment to using the courts and using the yes. legal system to yes. move things forward. Mr. Barry was certainly a part of that. He was yes. constantly trying to move things forward, yes. oftentimes behind the scenes, and people didn't even yes. know it yes. was happening. I was not aware until recently when I found some information that he had been one of the uh, founders in developing a neighborhood called uh, Hollydale. Mm -hmm. Very attractive neighborhood, and I was not aware of that until recently. I don't think many people are probably aware of that. And then in later years, you've had other great people who have been leaders of the local NAAC. I think of Marion Spencer, yes, who of course yes. is still with us yes, today. Yes, we were fortunate to have had her. I was not there at that time, but of course there was Dr. Hinton, Milton Hinton, right. and uh, uh, attorney Norma Davis, and Edith Throne, and of course now we have young Christopher Smitherman. You know, now you're working as the historian of the organization, and you have found a great deal of 
of, of things to use. But I suspect there's a lot of stuff out in the community that people who have been members of the organization, people who have been on boards and committees of the organization, probably have squirreled away in their basement someplace. Would they, would it be good, would you like to see people get those to, back to the organization? Oh, I would, I would. I'm always asking people to make contributions or donate. And of course, any time we get something in that people donate, our president will write a thank you letter and we will acknowledge that that is now a part of our collection. And I'm sure they're wonderful treasures. We, uh, I'm, we're trying to find his ashes because we understand that he had a funeral at- Mr. Dabney's ashes. Yeah, yes, Mr. Dabney's ashes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank Thank you. <laughs> so if anybody knows where yes, they are. Yes. Well, we're out of time this morning, and I certainly uh, hope that you have a good convention this week. It's exciting and certainly historic. And for the historian, historian of the local organization, it's got to be a great thing. Thank so you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for thank being you. here this morning. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women working to shape our community for the future. Have a good week. Thanks.